15 years ago, the car industry pretty much ignored the climate crisis and argued that they couldn't do anything about it. Along came Tesla and showed the world that you could build really attractive cars that are electric. Suddenly, the industry had an incentive to act. Today, you'd be hard-pressed to find a single car brand that does not have an electrification strategy. They would just not be taken seriously, and no one would want to hold on to their stock. Ideas matter, and an industry cannot continue ignoring a problem when the solution is staring everybody in the face. The world has decided to solve the climate crisis urgently. Most industries are on top of things. Wind power, solar power, electric cars are booming industries. It makes sense to start with energy systems and fossil fuels, but it can't stop there. The food industry is responsible for a quarter of the climate crisis, and it needs to be part of a solution if we're ever going to reach our goals. Yet, most people in the food industry and most companies in this industry act as if doing anything about this problem were optional. Why? This industry employs over two billion people. That's more than one in every four people on Earth. It has long and complicated supply chains with little transparency or overview and tight profit margins. Every food product that you find at a retailer today is there due to a long series of decisions that have been taken along this supply chain. Decisions where people have locally optimized for profit and no one has designed the structure of the whole. This is an example of something called a distributed network. Distributed networks are great for solving and optimizing for complex problems where overview is impossible. With the right configuration, such networks can solve basically any problem. They're, for example, used in the development of artificial intelligence. This specific distributed network, the food supply system, has with an impressive success optimized for the values asked of it. Delivery of high-quality food to a low cost with built-in resilience, constant availability. This is why you always can find a fresh banana at your local retailer, also in the middle of the winter. A century ago, we didn't have that. We had much lower and inconsistent quality, higher prices, and when crops failed, people starved. If this structure, the network structure, the food supply system is so good at optimizing, why is it at a loss for how to deal with the climate crisis? It turns out two key features of the, uh, of the configuration are missing. There's never really been any incentives for anyone to optimize for climate performance. And secondly, the network does not have the requisite tools and mechanisms for reliably communicating climate performance. It doesn't have the capacity to really communicate anything beyond price, quality, and availability. These three are sort of easy. The price, you charge that, you see that, you buy your banana, you know what you pay for it. The quality is easily measurable. You see if the banana has gone bad. And availability, it's easier still. You tend to notice when what you're looking for isn't even there. Go beyond that into less obvious qualities, such as invisible greenhouse gas emissions somewhere along the supply chain that you can't see on the product in your hand, it gets a lot more complicated. And the science for how to assess climate performance is complicated. The industry doesn't know how to proceed. How did the car industry solve this? Well, there is one important difference here. Proving that a car is electric is kind of easy. You quickly find a diesel engine if you start looking for it, and it's there. 
So the incentives were enough to get the innovation going. Now, what does that imply for us? How do we get the food supply system to start to optimize for climate performance and solve their part of the climate crisis? Can this even be done? To begin with, this is a solvable problem. Producing food without causing climate change does not violate the laws of physics. Trust me on this, I'm a physicist. It is also fully compatible with producing delicious, nutritious, tasty, healthy, and unhealthy food, just like we love it today. But we shouldn't fool ourselves into thinking that it's going to happen on its own, or that our governments are going to tell the industry how to do this, nor that the science community is going to come up with all the answers and just tell the industry. No, to solve this one, we are going to need to utilize the knowledge, wisdom, and ingenuity of our distributed network, the food supply system, from the farmers and all the way up to the senior managers of the biggest food conglomerates in the world. For efficient solutions to network problems, such as this one, the decisions need to be taken as close to the information as possible. That means on the ground, where the production actually happens. So how do we reconcile the need to move the decisions to the hands of the people on the ground with the science for how to assess performance being really complicated? A few years ago, when I was a researcher working at Chalmers University of Technology, spending my days thinking about how to solve the climate crisis as a scientist, I was home with my son. He was about a year and a half at the time. I watched him pick up an iPad, starting his favorite app, selecting a cartoon he wanted to watch, and press play. I had an epiphany. Streaming video from a server in another part of the world to a wireless computer here relies on some incredibly advanced science and technology. You don't have to go back many years and we couldn't do it at all. Yet, now, the user, user interface is simple enough for a toddler to use before he even learns how to speak. Once the science is worked out, using it can be made easy. And if we can get toddlers to do stuff like that, I'm sure we should be able to get the grown-ups in the food supply system to understand the climate consequences of their actions and decisions. There are some things that are really hard for humans, but are trivially easy for, compu uh, for computers such as processing large quantities of data, solving difficult equations, applying rules consistently, keeping secrets, keeping track of who did what and when. So I came up with a plan. It was time for me to leave academia and become an entrepreneur and start fighting the climate crisis as a tech founder, to make all the insights and all the science truly available on a large scale for those who need it all two billion of them. So the plan was to build a large digital network, sort of like Facebook. But instead of connecting friends and family, this network connects actors along the food supply system, all the way from all the farmers, logistics, through refinement with all its different steps, all the way up to retail, just like the way they make business in the real world. And instead of using this network for sharing videos of cute cats, which is important in its own right, but it won't exactly solve the climate crisis, this network calculates and shows the climate emissions for every step in food production along this chain, letting every decision maker understand and act on their part of the problem, and then show the world, and more importantly, their specific customers, precisely how good they are and when they make progress. This is climate transparency. OK, sounds nice. How do we do this? The platform, Digital Network, builds on four important principles. What is relevant information? There are billions of little business decisions between now and the world having solved the climate crisis by mid-century. These decisions need to be informed on a relevant level. 
crucially important here is that you don't need to understand why one option is better for the climate than another, than another option, as long as you understand what the consequences of the choice will be for the climate performance of your own products. Just like how my son didn't need to understand how and why the video started playing on the iPad, as long as he understood which of his actions that made it happen. What is fairness? This will only ever work if everybody trusts the platform. And to get there, every user on the platform must be treated the same. And no rule and no mechanism can ever get implemented unless it can be fairly implemented across the board. If you want your favorite food brands or suppliers to compete on climate performance, they need to trust that they are treated the same and measured the same, or they will not participate at all. Why should we limit transparency to climate performance? To begin with, we don't have to solve all the problems in the world at once. And there are a lot of decision makers out there who will never ever get on this platform if they need to be transparent about everything. They have important trade secrets such as recipes and other things that would tremendously hurt their businesses if they were disclosed. So let's not force them. The rules and the results are transparent. The details for every user are not. Which incentives do we need? There needs to be a low barrier for getting started and incentives for increased engagement over time. And the only way to look good on the platform must be to do good in the real world. And rewards for effort. When someone walks that extra mile to collect climate-relevant data that leads to insight, or they make an investment or even innovation that reduces their emissions, they must get benefits for it on the platform. A platform based on these rules can, if it gains momentum quickly enough, become a single source of truth, a shared view of climate information that can unlock the innovation and optimization potential of this network for solving their part of the climate crisis. We know how to do this from a science perspective. We've even already built this thing. So now how do we get our two billion people in the food supply system, not to mention the rest of the world, to benefit from this? Our governments are unfortunately ill-equipped for helping here. Their mandates are local by nature, and their decision-making processes are just too slow. This one starts with us, with you, I, your grandmother, people demanding transparency and voting with the wallets. Start holding your favorite food brands and retailers, or suppliers if you work in the industry, accountable on climate performance, and let them know that there is a market for climate transparent brands and products. Make sure they understand that we're talking about honest transparency, and of the quantitative kind, without oversimplifications such as traffic light schemes. Ask specific questions. What is the climate footprint of this banana? Why? Remember the incentive structure. What does 0.48 kilograms of carbon dioxide equivalent mean? Is it good? Of course you're not expected to understand that. But you will know that 0.47 is better, right? And that zero is the end goal. Senior managers, boards, and investors operate in the same way. Give them a number to work with, and they will focus on improving it. They start holding their managers and employees accountable on climate performance. They don't want to get beaten by the competition. Suddenly, climate performance becomes part of marketing, product development, procurement, and even recruitment. These companies move 
from viewing climate, the climate crisis as an abstract problem that I know what to do about into a business opportunity. And to be honest, they have to. The world has decided that we're going to solve this problem, so the companies that don't get started soon are probably not going to be around in the future. Do you like steak? Make sure your steak suppliers get the message. The sooner they start working on this, they have a lot of innovation to do, the more likely you are to secure your steak supply for the future. The companies that do start working on this, they start rewarding their employees for collecting climate-relevant data that leads to insights, investments, and innovation. They start paying premium to suppliers that perform better from a climate perspective because it makes their own products perform better. Premium pay for premium performance. That is a strong incentive to join the transparency movement, collect more and more data, and pressure their suppliers for transparency. The digital network grows. Step by step, our two billion people in the food supply system start making informed decisions that reduce their emissions and moving the world towards a future where the climate crisis is a thing of the past. Everybody being in control and enjoying the ride all the way. An important message and takeaway here is that Labels on products and consumer demand is not expected to solve anything. It's there to get this thing off the ground and get the industry into solution and optimization mode. After all, you cannot grocery shop a basket full of food with a zero climate footprint until there's a wide assortment of kick-ass products with a zero climate footprint to choose from. And we don't have that yet. There are no such products, but it is possible to get there. And to get there, we need the specific labels that can differentiate between 0.48 and 0.47. Or the many little steps of investment in innovation will not be visible and will never happen. Rewards for effort. End consumers can put the incentive in place, just like they've done for electric cars once they saw that it's possible. A distributed network of food, supply, food producers will take care of the rest and solve this problem for us in no time.